Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We will be sharing tips and providing resources on topics such as writing resumes, interviewing, using LinkedIn, and networking. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner Podcast. Today, our guest is Jawiria Dahir. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. We have a lot to go over, so we're going to try to jump in. We met, um, we talked over Zoom probably several, several months ago, um, and I just found your story fascinating. You are a world traveler, and we're going to get into that a little bit, um, but I'd like to start back. Um, you grew up in East Africa, is that correct? I was born there, yes. Okay. And at what age did you start to move around? Oh, my goodness. Um, so I was born in East Africa, and... I wasn't even a year old by the time we left. Oh, wow. Uh, that was a real, I was a baby. Yeah, I was an infant. Yeah. So where, so take us through kind of your journey before you got to Buffalo. Okay. Um, so the region that I am born in, um, it's where, look at um, East Africa. And so you've got Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Eritrea, all of those East African neighbors countries. And so the boundaries between them, unfortunately, um, have a lot of conflict. And so these are all artificial boundaries. It came um, after it's post-colonialism. And so there's a lot of tension in many parts of the country and a lot of instability. Um, and so when I was born, I was born in the 90s, um, my parents unfortunately um, became victim of that. And so they had no choice but to flee the country. Um, and they've never left their country. This was the first time they're kind of leaving their native land. Um, and believe it or not, we ended up in Switzerland, um, oh. rural parts of Switzerland. Uh, we ended up in a small town called Manedorf, which is part of Zurich. Um, so I speak Hochdeutsch, which is um, just uh, a type of German. Okay. And we lived there. Um, I lived there from the age of one up until um, I believe I was about maybe 10 or 11, um, okay. just kind of hitting my teens. So I went to school there. Um, and part of the reason why we moved to the rural part um, was because my mother is a farmer. And so she knew how to um, farm. And so she felt her biggest skill set or, you know, for her to be in a position to make money was to obviously farm. Not knowing that farming um, in our native land versus farming in Switzerland is going to be so different. But she was, a, she's a, you know, she's into agriculture and that's her thing. And so I think she made a good living from that. Um, it was difficult on us, of course, not living in a city. Yeah. Um, I think for her too, being, we were the only minorities, we were the only blacks in the whole town. Um, it was wow. difficult. And my mom was only in her twenties when she did this. So I don't oh know how goodness. she did this. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So you were 10 years old living in Switzerland. What was the next move that you made? Yeah. So from Switzerland, um, Part of the challenge became, at the time at least, now a lot of the legislations and policies have changed in Switzerland. So even if you're not a native Swiss, you have different opportunities now. At the time when we grew up, um, if you weren't a native Swiss, there were certain um, career paths that you were not able to enter. So at some point when you turn 18, you can't pursue medicine or the legal field the same way that the native person could. Really? And so, my, yeah. And so my mom pretty much um, made the decision and thought, well, you know, if if she if we have to leave everything behind and start over, why start over in a country where there's, again, additional limitations? Safety was great, but there's additional limitations. So she didn't like that crippling um, aspect of it and oh. then had to make, again, another difficult decision of where do we move from here? Um, but because we were already resettled in Europe, um, it made sense to kind of call other um, peers and friends in her network to say, well, now that we are in Europe, where else might there be additional opportunities um, where, you know, there's diversity opportunities for her, you know, the children, myself and my siblings to be able to thrive. And so everybody advised her to go to the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And so we did. We ended up in England um, and I pretty much lived in the UK up until 
I ended up moving here in Buffalo in 2013, which is a whole other story. Yeah, but, so um, I, I do have another question. Yeah. So you were saying back in, in Switzerland, this was like 2000, right? I mean, this, we're not yeah. talking years and years and years ago where exactly. you where you were restricted as to what you could do for a living. That's, Absolutely, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and if it wasn't for that, we, we would have stayed in Switzerland. Um, my mom really enjoyed where we lived. It was mm -hmm. a safe, clean neighborhood. Um, another thing that she really enjoyed was the fact that she could farm. So it wasn't like she, you know, it wasn't because she didn't go to college or she didn't even finish high school, but yeah. she was a farmer. Her grandma was a farmer and she was raised on a farm. Oh. Um, so this was pretty much, you know, she felt like she hit the jackpot and thought, you know, she can start all over. Um, yeah. But that wasn't the case. And so when we moved to the UK um, in hopes to really her sacrificing for us, yeah. We also had to move to the inner city at this point. And so, which affected my mom's employment. Um, she ended up being a, um, a cleaner, um, a janitor, just kind of cleaning hospitals and schools because number one, she didn't speak the language and now she didn't have the skill. And moving to the rural parts of the UK was just a lot more difficult. And so it made yeah. sense for us to live in the city. Yeah. So a lot of sacrifice on her end for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And she mm -hmm. was still relatively young <laughs> while she's young. doing all of this yeah, yeah. oh my god I don't and, I mean at you know at the age of 20 you're still deciding um if you're gonna go to Burger King or Subway yeah um, I think that's kind of the it's it's um it sounds all fun and games but to think that she had to endure the travel um a divorce at the same time you know my mom and dad didn't see eye to eye on some things and so for her to then be a single mom raise us um and not having the credentials or the knowledge her biggest really um, um, influence on us was making sure that we work hard in school. We weren't allowed to miss a single day. Um, it didn't matter if we had fever. It didn't matter oh, what really? was going on. Because if we were sick and we were so sick to yeah. stay home, she would stay home from work. So oh. she would say, "We will. I will stay home because you must be so unwell. Uh, and that was worse. So we would oh, rather yeah. go to school sick. <laughs> <laughs> and stay home with my mom from be sick. <laughs> well, and you think about so, it, moving to a yeah. place and you didn't speak the language as well. That just not at all. Yeah. That I I often look at a lot of the students that I see coming mm -hmm. from all over the world, and sometimes they don't speak, you know, really great English, and they sit in a class and they're able to comprehend it. It just it, I marvel by it because I just don't see. Americans doing that in foreign countries, but foreign countries, people come yeah. here and, and are able to, to do that. And, and I just, I think that's amazing. So you growing yeah. up, you, you had how many languages then did you actually know and could speak? I, yeah. So I speak, I speak um, Swiss German, which is called um, Deutsch. So it's different okay. from Dutch, which Dutch is spoken in Netherlands. Um, I also speak Swedish, which is um, Svenska. And then English and then Somali too. Wow. That's yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Um so so as a kid, do you do you remember like what you were thinking you might want to do when you grew up? So the challenge was um so me for me growing up, because I came to Switzerland so young, I didn't know the story and the journey that my mom had to go through. So for okay. me, it was more like I'm going to kindergarten here. This is the community that I'm part of. This is my home. Um, and then slowly you start to pay attention. And I think for the first time, I realized that I was different in first grade. And my mom kind of walked me through that process of me actually looking around and saying, oh, I do look different. Oh, there are some things that are extinctly different about me. And my story is different when certain questions are asked. Um, and I think once I discovered that I was different, I was so interested in learning more about who I was to better really navigate the world um, and that was the biggest challenge for me just like you know who am I what's my identity um, speaking different languages and then even moving to the UK um, at the, I was in seventh grade by the time I moved to the UK and now I can't I don't speak a single word of English and that became so different and culturally it was difficult so I have you know the East African culture being taught at home and then I grew up in Switzerland rural parts of, so I have adapted to that and assimilated and then you're thrown in the UK and it's just a bombshell all over again. Yeah. I don't, and just learning English language was very tough. Um, and I remember just the first six months kind of just crying to my mom and saying, hey, we should just move back to Switzerland. You know, I miss my friends. I miss the school. I was a part Aww. of the community. And so, and I think 
luckily my mom um instead of saying no she would kind of leave the door open and say you know what let's give it two years you know things will change and if you really don't like it after two years we're going to move back and then you know as a kid after two years you kind of adapt and make friends so i don't think i even asked her after two years she was pretty smart doing that (laughs) right and i think it was a I think it was a great thing that we eventually did move to the UK because um, in terms of its diversity, in terms of opportunity, you know, there was no limitation there. The sky was the limit. So we had access to resources, access to information, knowledge, where there wasn't a system that was going to tell us you can or you cannot do. Uh, um, so okay. I think I think that was very comforting for my mom. Um, yeah. We just kind of moved on. And for me, I looked at my mom as an entrepreneur. And I think farmers are the best types of entrepreneurs. <sighs> Yeah, so that's kind of where I my entrepreneurial mindedness comes from. And to me, entrepreneurship really just also means someone who can solve problems, right? right. Making money from it is great, but you're constantly finding ways to solve problems. You're innovative um, and you're not stuck on right. one way. You're very coachable. I think those are all traits um, that right. my mom definitely passed on to us. Wow. So, I mean, what a great know, mentor. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, don't it, it, it's true, though, as we get older, we look back and then we appreciate things more. But while you're living it, you don't really, you know, you think you just think that everybody is doing the same thing. <laughs> but but life, life is very different for many different people. Can you imagine like all the things that you've achieved so far? I mean, you're still very young, but you've you've achieved so many things. And in a minute, I'm going to list some of them. And it just like the list just goes on and on. And you have been blowing up LinkedIn. Like every time I turn it on, you're on there with, with something. You've received this, you received that. I'm like, wow, you are, you're like on fire. You really are. Thank you. So could you have really- imagined with all the different places that you lived mm-hmm. and, and now where you are right now, looking back, like, all the things that you've achieved so far, you have so much more time in your life to achieve. I don't know if you have many more things on your list because you could cross off a lot of them at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, um, there's, I think it, it the, the only thing is every time I do something, um, it's been a lot of times it's been me doing it for the first time. Um, so my challenge on the other hand has been not so much doing it for the first time, but again, the other side of things being the first it's not fun being the first because there's a lot of questions. There's a lot more stares and expectations on you. A lot yeah. more, you know, there's a, a, a goggle vision on you. So um, I started off my career um, in the UK. I was kind of starting off on the technology side of things. And I was figuring out, you know, what do I do? How do I navigate this space? My mom wanted me to be a doctor. I think I think that's every immigrant parent's mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hate science and I was never good at science. Um, and I knew for sure I could not kind of look up, you know, be in a medical facility, see blood, none of that yeah. stuff. Like I, I can't I hear that. you. <laughs> so I'm like, how do I impact the world in a positive way without being a physician? Because everybody seems to think physicians are the only route. Um, and that was kind of tough on tough on me. But I think just focusing on the different um, aspects of you know what makes communities how how the environment is built and what res- how resources are kind of you know spared or navigated how certain communities um, experience prosperity and sometimes prosperity bypasses certain populations kind of understanding those logistics is really what allowed me to then pursue the path that I did because I've never had a goal where I said okay in the next five years I will achieve this it's just been a roller coaster of different things happening at the right time different connections. Um, authentic connections, um, and then those interactions leading to a better opportunity. Um, And so in the UK, I started off my bachelor's degree there. Um, I didn't graduate in the UK. I ended up transferring when I came to Buffalo. Um, And we'll get to that in a minute because my husband lives in Buffalo. That's kind of what brought me here. But um, before that, you know, I was going to stay in the UK and finish off my bachelor's degree there. And I think I probably would have done whatever I'm doing here over there. Um, but I love that I'm doing it here because where I lived in the UK, in Birmingham, Birmingham is so much more advanced. It's it's almost, and I hate to say this, but it's almost like 50 years ahead of Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> so there, yeah. a lot of things are already built. The foundation is there, but a lot of things have already been built. In Buffalo, you get to be part of the process. So wow. I think it's so exciting to now be able to be part of that history making. So 50 years from now, it's all oh, here are the people who contributed to this vitality. So right. I, I, I love being here. So this is home. Yeah. So, so I guess we, the next question is you said your husband brought you to America. Did you meet in the UK or how, how did that work out? 
<laughs> so he he did a trans he did, he went to Duval and Duval has a um, kind of a, a study abroad program etc. And so we had some mutual friends that introduced us. And so you know, long story short, he ended up telling me he lived in New York, and <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's definitely another story for another day. But <laughs> I think in my mind, um, I and I thought he lived in New York City. Yeah. And so a lot of my friends back in the UK still think I live in New York City. <laughs> in fact, just a few um a few years ago, I had a friend of mine who um got a a job or I think it was an internship, I'm not sure. She went to New York City and she texts me and says, "Hey, Juaria, I'm in New York for a few days. We should grab coffee." And oh I'm like, hmm, I'm kind of six hours away from where you are. And she couldn't believe it. She really thought, you know, she thought, well, do you live somewhere else? And I'm like, no, I'll show you on the map where I live. I still live in New York, but it's just not where you are. Um, so, funny. yeah, I mean, the scale of things are just so different here compared to the UK. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of what brought me here. And then wow. ever since, I mean, 2013, I think Buffalo was definitely different to what it is now. Um, yeah. I live here on the west side. So I don't know if you've seen the commercial corridors on Grand Street and all of that, but it was it was um it was pretty empty and so yeah. now to see that vitality come back Niagara streets and the storefronts that are opening up I think there's a lot of prosperity and we're on the right path let's just say that yeah you're definitely on the right path so right now currently you're the executive director for the entrepreneurship for all e for all can you tell oh, yeah. us a little bit about what that is sure um I'll take a step back so that you yeah. have a sense of maybe how I ended up with um e for all so um, I spent the last six years, well, prior to joining E4All, I spent the last six years um, working in governments. And I, my, I, have a, I, I pretty much got my master's degree from University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. So I focused on um, design, planning, real estate. Um, and the work that I did for the city was primarily focused on neighborhood beautification, um, restoration initiatives, um, a ton of poverty um, alleviation work housing development, economic development. But when you think about economic development, it was mostly on kind of at the 3,000 elevated level. So you're mm -hmm. not looking at the, the, the one entrepreneur starting a business. Um, you're kind of looking more so, oops, hold on, I'm getting this quick call. Deny that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was more so looking at how to grow the workforce, um, expanding economic opportunities. So not so much looking Ooh. at what does it take for a small business to open up. And even though that work is important because, you know, growing the workforce, growing the economy, that's really connected. Sure. Um, I spent six years doing that, spent six years understanding the community, understanding um, how our government operates, how governance is structured, policies, drafting policies, working with the common council, working with the mayor. And then, of course, traveling. Um, I spent so much time going to different states, learning from other city leaders. Oh. Um, I had opportunities to go to Harvard for that. Um, Bloomberg conferences, you name it. So connecting the dots definitely to see, you know, where is Buffalo? How does Buffalo's history predict what the future will be? You know, what things do we need to do different, better, et cetera? What kind of leader I want it to be? And so when COVID hit, round about that time, I kind of hit this crossroad of, I don't know if I can have um, the type of impact that I want to in the space that I'm currently at, because there are some red tapes and some limitations when you do work in government, even though it can be very innovative. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the only, and the other aspect of work that I haven't experienced was supporting small businesses and seeing the challenge from the business sector. What is it when somebody wants to just open up a business, the red tape and the challenge that they experience? And so, um, kind of tying that back to my education also for my planning side of things, my thesis yeah. was primarily focused on um, minorities and kind of new American populations, um, opportunities and challenges to starting businesses and what it's wow. like here. So I studied a lot of the startup companies from Wheaties um, on all these small business support programs and services. And mm -hmm. I saw kind of where some of the challenges lied, even with the Buffalo Billion, some of the um, monies that was being dumped here. And I, rem I remember just telling one of my mentors, hey, you know, I'm, I think I'm ready to move on and pivot, but I'm not quite sure. Um, a lot of the nonprofit works that I've looked at, because I've studied them on my thesis, and I don't think I'm interested in working for them because I know why they're not at the point that they should be at, or I yeah. kind of understand their challenges, so I don't know if I want to be part of that system. And um, I also felt like a lot of the nonprofits were being burnt out, so and I didn't want that for me. And so... Around about that same time, Chuck Schumer was having a meeting with the business leaders here in Western New York, mm -hmm. where Key Bank and the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and a few others, and E4All 
and others were on a call and they happened to connect and then conversation started about, oh, we should bring E4L to the West of New York market. It's a great opportunity. Okay. And so in the midst of all of that, um, Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and KeyBank became the champions for trying to attract E4L. They learn about me, someone who's interested to pivot, which was my mentor who also was in that mix. And they said to kind of just, it was just a phone call away that said, hey, you should consider E4L. It's a national company. You've talked about small businesses for a very long time. Um, and it's, and I said, well, let me look into them. And the two main things I really liked, which kind of encouraged me to pursue this path was, number one, it was a national company. So I knew it mm. would learn from others. So it wasn't us just replicating or doing something or reinventing the wheel for the first time. Right. If it's being done and it's successful in Boston, we can do it here in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing was the fact that the programming was free for entrepreneurs because so many programs and services, it's free for the first two weeks and then there's a $90 cost or oh. there's limitations on the types of entrepreneurs. So you look at certain programs, it'll say, if you're into, um, if you're in the restaurant business, you can come to Weedy, for instance. But if you have a Lego business, you can't go to Weedy. Then does that make sense? Oh, so it's, it's yeah. different challenges like that. And so I thought that was kind of exciting. Um, yeah. And so I pretty much jumped on the opportunity, and then I became the executive director. Um, we had a big press conference. We launched it here, and then I started hiring and recruiting, and kind of the rest is history. Now wow. we've been here since May of 2021. That's amazing. And, and through it all, you know, dealing with COVID and, and all of that, what, what that brought to entrepreneurs, especially small businesses and how to maneuver and, and figure all of that out. And they were all doing it at the same time, but nobody really had the answers because no one had ever been through any of this before. So exactly. what a time, what a time to jump on board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm well, sure right, it's not especially a, when, yeah, especially when doors were shutting and, you know, I, I wasn't sure where if people were even interested in being entrepreneurs because yeah. that was a big gamble for many people. But um, seeing that, you know, the programming was free, that there was strong mentorship, telling people, hey, if you have an idea, now is the time to validate your idea. Um, come with your commitment and we'll give you the support, some seed money and let's get we're going to get you accelerated. And removing those barriers of, you know, their credit scores, their socioeconomic statuses, their background, their education, their knowledge of business. It's just an idea. And if they can come forth with it, we would support them. I think that was very encouraging. Um, yeah. And, you know, we've we've never had um, an, a low application season. And I think part of that is because this is such an entrepreneurial minded community. So I'm glad that Entrepreneurship for All decided to come to Western New York. Um, yeah, we're the only absolutely. one. Um, and it's 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 insane. And we don't see many big comp national companies like that come to Buffalo. So no. it's definitely something to brag about. Yeah, it definitely is. And so you said that they're in, Buffalo is the only place they're in in New York. Yes, in New York, oh. Buffalo is the only place. Yeah, that otherwise is amazing. They're, in, they're in Massachusetts, in um, Colorado, in um, you name it, everywhere else. But oh. in New York, Buffalo is the only site. Hmm. Well, that that is really something. So, mm -hmm. so you're you're busy uh, <laughs> a little bit <laughs> with that. Um, when did you decide to become an adjunct professor at Damon University? What, wh where did that all come about? So when I did that started, um, so my first job, um, when I was, I think I was maybe 14, my first job, I was a tutor. Um, mm -hmm. and my mom used to give us pocket money, but the pocket money was like one pound and 50 cents and <laughs> 50 pence, I should say. So one pound 50 is not going to get you a lot. <laughs> and I remember just asking my mom and just saying, hey, you know, other kids are getting a lot of pocket money. We're not getting anything. Can't even buy an ice cream. I have to save up for a whole month. And she just said, well, why don't you get a job? <laughs> you can pay for your things. And I said, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. And I was so pissed off. And I said, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to have my own money. And I won't need your one pound fifty anymore. <laughs> and I just started, I put together, I just started asking some of the kids, um, in my school at the time, who was just struggling with their homework, um, if they needed extra help, and I would help them. And it started with one kid, and then it went to the second kid, and then that went on, and I would actually have, and then I had like an after-school program almost. So oh they God. would come on and each time, and then it, we had like a booking system. And so I would book and say, <laughs> okay, for this hour, it's you, and then I would take a break, and then it's and then it's this group of people. And I would try to tell them, like, figure out with the, your other classmates what your biggest challenge is, and then come to me with that. So it be literally became a business for me and I yeah. really enjoyed it. 
um, fast forward when I even moved to um, when I started working in government, mm -hmm. um, I was always interested in bringing interns. So I would always say mm -hmm. we should we need to bring in fresh mindsets because I really think when you're teaching or paving the way for someone else, it's a two way learning process. So I always wanted to make sure I understood what they were learning and then they understood what I was learning. So it's a two way mm -hmm. street. So I started taking interns and every single Every single year, I would have at least one person partnered up with me per season. Mm -hmm. um, and then we opened up and we started um, applying for something called AmeriCorps Vista. And mm -hmm. I did a grant and with a state office. And then we started getting AmeriCorps. And they're not like interns, but they're also, again, young people who are dedicated to allevi alleviating poverty. And they build capacity. So they build capacity working with a supervisor doing some data-driven work or analyzing information or holding community meetings, pretty much gathering information and then supporting an agency. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like those were also students. So it's I've always found a way to teach or kind of give myself that opportunity to not just be doing my day job, but then also mm -hmm. giving back and having a student work under me, et cetera, et cetera. And so I happen to be invited... Um, to a panel discussion um, on entrepreneurship, and it was with Damon. Um, and then after that opportunity, um, I got some. I got. So I made some connections with Damon. Um, Dan ended up um, connecting and reaching out to me and a few others, and they informed me that you know there was a great opportunity to. They were looking for an adjunct professor. Um, they had already done some, their homework on me and knew my background, and asked me if I could send them my resume just to kind of double check. So yeah. I did, and then asked me if I would be interested in teaching um, the, um, the class that I do teach, which is social entrepreneurship. Um, and I said, absolutely, why not? Yeah. So that's kind of how that came about. Um, so it's I a taught, perfect fit. It's a perfect fit. Um, and the students that took the class with me um, had an opportunity to work with all the companies that were under our belt with e for all here. Oh. And they attended a pitch contest. Um, they ended up even helping to score some of those um, applicants. So one of the things that I like about e all is when people apply, when an entrepreneur submits an application, mm -hmm. it's not just me and my staff that say yes and no. It's the community that gets to apply to become readers. So you can sign okay. up, become a reader, which allows you to read an application anonymously, not seeing their name. You see their business idea. You see the problem they're trying to identify. You, they're like, however scalability it is, et cetera, there's a set of questions they have to answer. And then you give them quality feedback. And if they're, oh. even if they're not accepted into the program, the pitch or the accelerator, they take that feedback. Um, and sometimes that's all some people need. And yeah. so the students were able to do that. I, on the back end, was able to review the types of feedback they were giving because um, they had studied with me and we went over the types of quality feedback we want to give to our companies. And so it was real experience. And a lot of them would say, you know, entrepreneurship has just been like a theoretical thing for me until I joined this class and now I'm able to, you know, actually help another person validate their business, which is huge. Yeah. What a win-win because the students get to see how people take problems within the community and try to come up with solutions Yeah, and, and they get to see it live, like, you know, right in front of them. So that yeah. that's an amazing opportunity for them. So yeah. You've had some really big moments in your life recently. So hot off the presses, I just saw this, like, I think was last week. You received the Tech for Good, for good 2022 uh, Buffalo Emerging Technology Award Showcase. Um, you're a recipient of the prestigious Western New York Prosperity Fellow. Uh, yep. The 2021 Athena Young Professional Leadership Award recipient. The 2021, is it LISC, L-I-S-C, Community yes. Builder Award? Yep. Uh, the 2019 recipient of the Business First 30 Under 30, the winner of the inaugural Outstanding American Muslim Millennial Award, that's a mouthful, in 2016, and yeah. the 2015 Buffalo Urban League Young Professionals Community Engagement Award recipient. But I have to say, and I don't know if you'll agree or not, but I'm assuming that the biggest event of your life so far has been the birth of your son that just yeah. was only a couple uh, months ago, correct? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow, you have been incredibly yes. busy. Like, I, you make me really tired <laughs> just by hearing no, all the things that you've done. Well, because, you know, behind all of those awards is hard work and is collaboration and is looking for the future of your son Absolutely. and and what you're going to leave him with knowing that you were a huge 
um, component of all of what's going to be happening and has been happening in Buffalo, which, you know, you were saying in 2013, when you looked at Buffalo, you know, you, you didn't know what was going to be happening in, in the near future. And now you look at it and it's really exciting. Like I've lived here all my life and I've got to say over the last 10 years, 20 years, things have changed so much for the better because we just didn't know where we were headed. And it, it looked like we were headed the other way. And then people came together, vision and, and then purpose, and they made things happen and, and continuously make things happen. So, and you've been such a huge, huge component of all of that. So um, honestly, you know, from where I'm sitting, thank you, because it's, you're refreshing, you're, you, you inspire so many people and working with college students, you're inspiring them every day by seeing what you're doing and your vision. So, um, so congratulations on everything. Congratulations on having a son. So here we go. I have two. Um, so what has motherhood taught you at this point, two months into this? <laughs> What, what oh has been God. your biggest thing that you've learned from all of that? Oh, um, okay. So bombshell at my new baby is my third child. Oh, your third. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> well, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're I'm, actually a pro at this. I, oh my God. No way. I'm not. Um, but so, but this, my third child has been the most special child. I'll, I'll tell you why. So I'm 30 now. My two other ones, I was 21 and 22. And I have a nine-year-old and an eight-year-old. And it was a time when, you know, we're just moving here, um, just resettling to a new country, figuring things out, not even having the right paperwork to start my education or get a job. So there were so many limitations. Um, my husband was still an undergrad. I'm still looking to transfer. So we were really um, in a rough, um, rough place. And his parents definitely supported us um, and brought us under their wings. Um, but I didn't have anything called maternity. Like my second son, so it's Mikhail and Gabriel. When Gabriel was born, he was born July 27. By August 24th, I was back in school again to, um, in my next semester. And we were in a difficult spot where we were, um, we, were take, we, were taking, we were on food stamp. We had to take um, WIC, which means... You know, you've got to go in line and get a specific type of bread. So it was really a difficult time of our life. And I think mm -hmm. even then, we never thought, okay, let's pause. Because we knew we were in a position where we could still do what we wanted and pursue the life and pretty much create the life that we wanted. And so we moved on. And the, univer the university definitely supported us with child care. So there was definitely a village that was supporting us. And I share this because... A lot of people just think, you know, oh, the minute you go through a challenge, whether it's um, a breakup or having a kid or kind of deviating from this generic linear route that a, a woman or a man should take, that, you know, you're already set to fail. It's really not true. Uh, right. There's definitely not been anything that I've done in a linear way. And after we had the two kids, that's really when I, you know, when we both graduated, um, I got my, well, my husband got his bachelor's degree in 2013 that summer. I ended up getting mine in 2015 and then right away went to grad school, went, started the architecture and planning program. Um, and then things went on. So having Adam now, it's like I'm an adult who had a kid for the very first time. And yeah. I am actually enjoying maternity. So I keep telling everybody like, this is my first child. So I would have actually answered your question definitely <laughs> as a first mom, um, cause I haven't been able to do this. Like I have great health insurance. I'm in financially in a whole different bracket than I ever was. Um, we have a home. It's um, my my son doesn't see us going to school and worrying about the things that we did with the other two. Um, uh -huh. The other two are pretty much like now they're like my little brothers, I think, because of the fact <laughs> that we went through everything together. So I think motherhood, um, there isn't an age for it. You can be a mom at a very young age or a much older age. But, you know, it's the same thing. Babies cry, they poop, and they're they're demanding. That's for sure. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah they are, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. If, if, if anything, they kind of shape who you are. And so it's, um, it's I think it's a privilege. So I'm really, I'm really. Well, and your, and your mother really showed you, I mean, you know, you take both of your lives, your mother going from one country to another at almost the same age and having children and going, not speaking the language and showing her kids how to 
be successful. Like she Mm -hmm. showed you how to do that without really maybe even needing to do it. She was living her life, showing you day to day. And that was your Mm -hmm. example. And then when you came here, it, you know, it didn't stop you. It didn't slow you down because you knew that you could get through it. And, and as, as tough as it was, but really as tough as it was, don't you think now that having lived that now you can use that in your job and in your community and, and really have a really deeper empathy and understanding for the people that you're working with and for knowing because you lived that you, you walked those streets and you understood that. And I think that, you know, you can learn some things in books, but when you actually live it yourself and experience it, it's a whole different experience and and you come out of it with mm-hmm. a, a different um, perception of, of the whole issue. So absolutely. And you're teaching it's, your, your kids that too, as your mother taught you, you're, you're showing your kids what to do as well. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, you can at any point, um, as long as, you know, you've got your health and you're in a position where you're mobile, you can really, you can, you're in control of your own destiny. I guess maybe that's the bigger, um, yeah, the bigger message. And so I think, I think for my mom, the, the things that she had to do, I think it was a huge sacrifice on her and, and she could have given up at any point. And I think if she had given up, I know we we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so even just kind of, you know, the ups and downs and not knowing what the future is going to hold, but knowing that no matter what position or environment you're in, forging the right types of relationship with people, opening yourself up, being vulnerable in that space, and then um, being hungry to learn, to grow, um, and not taking no for an answer, like all of those things are so important. But I think for the most part, it's also just the coachability aspect of things, because the minute you go around pretending or assuming that, you know, you know it all, nobody's going to want to support or guide you. And I think in my life, in every way, I've always had a mentor. Um, And I mentor people now because of that. And that's part of the reason why I like teaching, because I look at those students and the people that I teach or pave the way for as really my mentors. you got to have mentors that are older than you and younger than you. That's so important, yeah. especially the younger ones. They're going to teach you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they certainly yeah. do. Yes. Yeah. Well, so you're so busy. You, you're not only the executive director, but you're also mm-hmm. a board member for HEAL, um, H-E-A-L yep. International, yep. a non-for-profit organization in the heart of Buffalo's West Side on yep. women's empowerment, economic mm-hmm. development, youth enrichment programs. You work with socially and economically disadvantaged uh, communities teaching life skills to help with self-sufficiency. How rewarding has that been for you? Oh my goodness. So the reason why that's even so rewarding to me is because I get to experience and see some of the things that like with my, with those, with my clients, some of those women are literally experiencing and doing exactly what my mom did. And so for me, when my mom tells me about what she did and how she had to endure a new country and language um, just kind of basic understanding things that we take for granted that the any every you know everyday person understands and knows, right? But for most people, they don't know that because they just don't know. And yeah. so I think working with refugees and others like that, um, or just even low income and marginalized communities, people that are just not financially literate, um, who are preyed upon in this market sometimes, being able to work with them, support them, guide them, and mentor them, I think I it gives me a glimpse of what my mother went through. And so I'm, you know, my hope is that they'll do the same thing, understand how to better their lives, understand how to make really smart choices for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's very rewarding. And I think um, I, I owe it to my mom definitely to do this type of work. And what's yeah. exciting is um, Heal International as an organization, um, we used to rent out a building. So we were tenants of Jericho Road for a decade. Oh, yeah. And then um, eventually a building just right across the street on West Ferry, the intersection between Herkimer and West Ferry, a vacant building became available. Um, and it was set to be demolished by the city. And so we pretty much put our hand up, negotiated with the city, we purchased the building, and then we did a whole infill development. So now it's a two-story unit. We have tenants upstairs. It's small business incubators. Um, so there's, it's, we're self-sufficient as a building. Um, there's a community center space and a cafe that's run and operated by women, um, oh female gosh. entrepreneurs, which is very specific. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then it's open to the community. So if you, if anybody wants to hold a meeting or a conference or wants to just kind of, you know, 
have a gathering space for anything that's positive, they can come and reserve the space free of charge, use the Wi-Fi, hopefully eat while they're there, um, grab a drink from the coffee shop. Um, and then the three other tenants are upstairs. So that's part of, again, it's kind of building this self-sufficiency model, supporting the community, knowing that the space we're building is also part of them. I think that's also one of the biggest, um, that was a, a big hooray moment when we purchased that building. So I'm, I'm yeah. always bragging about that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You, you've achieved so many things in your career. What are your aspirations for the future? I mean, I, I, I would retire if I were you, you just <laughs> so much, but, but what do you, you know, what do you hope for, for Buffalo? What, what are your aspirations for your future? Um, I guess my hopes for Buffalo is, um, first it's for my for my children first of all to to do really well that's my hope I, I i want to make sure that they do well um i want them to hopefully consider staying in buffalo that they look at buffalo as a cool place to live work and play yeah. um but on a grander scale i mean it's just for everybody to just be in a position where they're um able to thrive and they're able to choose you know whether it's entrepreneurship whether it's education, whatever it is, to be able to live a good quality of life. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's so simple to say that, but like so many people don't know how to do that um, right. or are not in a position to do that um, for very, for various reasons, from systemic issues to you name it. But mm -hmm. for Buffalo to just be in a better place, and I think that starts with you know the policy side of things, it's the business side of things, it's the, edu it's the education market. Like it, It's going to take everybody collaborating. And so I think my work is part of the puzzle um, but we definitely need everybody else also collaborating in this space. But for everybody just to be able to have a good quality of life, I think that's going to be so important because um, yeah. the disparity gap is just widening and it's just um, it's it's horrible. And too, like too many people are just being left behind, which is devastating. Yes. Yes. If, if you were asked by young women right now, what advice would you give them starting out in their careers? Um, do you have some sound advice for them? Hmm. Sound advice. Um, well, I would say just looking at me, for instance, um, sometimes I get judged on, you know, I, I have people who will ask me the question just by looking at me, you know, does, do you speak the language um, or making assumptions um, about maybe why I dress the way that I dress or, you know, assuming that I'm illiterate or things of that nature because of the bias or I don't know if it's media perceptions or whatever they got their story from. Things that, like outwardly how we look, our physical appearances, you know, our, I guess our skin color, just things that we can't really, our height, our gender, or you name it, um, things that maybe we're not in a position to, you know, drastically change or yeah. be different from and we're going to be judged on. Um, you can't change those things, but how we respond to those criticisms is definitely something we're in, in control of. Mm. And so I'm usually careful on how I respond. Um, if it's an opportunity to educate somebody on it, um, I mean, occasionally I have a lot of fun with it when people say, do you speak English, you know, but um, <laughs> so it just depends on which mood I'm in. But you know, the biggest advice is just, you know, don't let people just because of those outward perceptions of you and you and doors being shut, don't take no as an answer, Con mm. like push, push, push through and be confident knowing that even if you are the only person that looks or comes with your experience, knock on that door and put your best foot forward. It doesn't mm. matter if you get 10 no's, you might still get that one yes. Um, yeah. So just being able to be confident in you, who you are and not having to change that. Because the minute you start to question yourself and say, well, is it true? Am I really, you know, do I have to change the way that I look? Because I mean, I'm not, I'm never going to be a middle-aged white man. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And on, on, on a lot of entrepreneurship, when you think about entrepreneurship, you think about a middle-aged white man heading towards Silicon Valley. That's the kind of image everybody thinks of, but that's yeah. not the image that's true and reflective. So really saying that you can own your own space, um, I think that's definitely important. And it's just, so representation matters. So I try to go out as much as I can. I try to advocate for people and hopefully just seeing how different I look, maybe that gives them some inspiration to also be comfortable in their own skin. Absolutely. You know, it reminds me, I, in January, I interviewed my grandmother-in-law who was turning a hundred and oh. I, yeah. And I asked her, um, you know, she actually went to college, which, you know, I thought was also interesting, but wow. I, you know, in her, in her world, she had three choices as a woman a hundred years ago, she could be, um, a nurse, 
a teacher or a secretary. And those were her three choices. And so now you think, you know, a hundred years later, I, wow. I tell students all the time, if they can envision it, they can make it happen. Mm -hmm. And and that is such a such a change of mindset from a hundred years ago when yeah. you had three choices. Now your choices are unlimited and, and you really can make anything happen. And you're mm -hmm. you're just proof of that. Yeah. Oh my God. I have to watch the segments. Um, yeah. You it's, just, it's a, it's a tear. I have to watch that. Oh my God. The yeah. God bless. Cause, wow. Cause you learn, you learn so yeah. much from, from people who like your mother who have, have already lived through it. And it's a fascinating story. I mean, it's just, it just is. And I think it gives women, especially uh, inspiration Absolutely. to, to forge ahead. Why can't we, if, if your mother can move her children to different right. countries and not speak a language and yeah. make it work and, and have successful children, then mm -hmm. we really don't have any excuses. <laughs> like we really we, don't. Yeah, exactly. Um, because, you know, for me, when I moved to Buffalo, I mean, I'm already, regardless of like the challenges that I faced, I'm educated. I can speak the language. I have, I know how to acquire. And many like, more. <laughs> I have resources. And it's so different. But for her, yeah, yeah, to not have, to not even be from that world, to not know a single word, to not know anyone in that community um, to just land somewhere yeah. and start from nothing, um, it 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 takes it takes um it takes someone Grit. very courageous to do. That. Yeah, it takes a lot. Yeah, um, it really does. And yeah. and you know, and I think you said it before, but thank goodness that she she didn't stop. That she just yeah. kept moving along because, and yeah. I you know I'm sure as you as a mother and as myself as a mother, um, yeah. we would do anything for our children. And that's mm -hmm. probably where your mother was coming from. She would have given you anything she possibly could to make you succeed. And so, yeah. you know, we give up whatever mm -hmm. we need to in order to have our children have what, what they need. So, well, yeah. I, thank Absolutely. you so much today. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I know that you really are literally juggling everything. And not only do you have the birth of your son, but you also have two other children. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're, luckily really, they're in school. So <laughs> <laughs> you really have your hands full, but, but thank you, you know. so much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you. And if you enjoy Sharp um, HR Career Corner podcast, I'd be honored if you would leave a review wherever you listen to it. Reviews help us be seen by more people. So thank you in advance. Until next time, be kind, everyone. We need to show a lot more kindness in the world. And it starts with you and I. Thanks for listening and have a great day.